Coming up next, from litigator to administrator to local history maker, meet Angela Alsobrooks, the state's attorney for Prince George's County. Find out what fuels her passion for public justice, what she considers top priorities for the county, and how this working mom balances life inside and outside the courtroom on this edition of Conversations with Charlene Dukes. Welcome, I'm Charlene Dukes, president of Prince George's Community College. We have a great program in store for you today. I'm honored to have as my guest, Angela Also Brooks, the youngest person and the first woman to be elected state's attorney for Prince George's County, Maryland. She not only leads a team of 90 attorneys and 100 administrative staff, she oversees more than 40,000 cases a year and also lobbies legislatures, pushing for new state laws. She plays a key role in public safety, and under her leadership, conviction rates have risen and crime rates have reduced to record lows. A proud mom and a longtime resident of Prince George's County, she's one of the region's most influential women, and she's a strong supporter of the college. Welcome, Ms. Also Brooks, and thank you for being on the program. We've yeah. known each other for a long time. We have. And uh, I know that our public knows a lot about your professional life. So why don't we start talking about who you are as a person? So tell us a little bit about your background and your early life. Well, you know, my family came to Prince George's County in 1956 from Seneca, South Carolina, my mother's family. And we came here as a result of my great grandfather's murder. Um, by a police officer there, and the family was told that if they didn't leave, the entire family would be killed. And so the family came here within a week um, and came actually to Fairmont Heights, Maryland, where my family has been uh, since we moved here, Fairmont Heights, and now we've uh, lived in near Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, but that's how the family came here. I'm uh, one of two children, uh, proud parents still. My parents still live in Camp Springs, and I really, really uh, love Prince George's County. Well, I, I will say that um, we'll talk a little bit later about how that murder impacted you and what you do today. But I know that your parents are very special to you. And right. what we heard about was such a, a moving speech that he made uh, during your induction. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about your relationship with your parents, your mom and your dad? You know, I have been blessed with great parents. Um, I recognize that over and over again, and they are not only wonderful parents, but they've become my best friends and supporters as well. My father uh, said in, in, during my investiture that he calls me little fella. What he didn't say <laughs> is he, he said, well, I used to call her little fella. He still does. They miss absolutely nothing in my life. Um, as a, a small child in school, I remember whenever I had to go in front of the school for anything, even if it was just to say welcome to today's program, <laughs> my parents would be sitting right there. Uh, they attended every single thing, and when I left, my father would say, you were so articulate, you were the best in the program. My mother's the same way, and they continue to be those supporters. I've gone to community meetings, even recently, and my parents were sitting in the audience. So I have, uh, I enjoy the, the love, and I've enjoyed the support of two absolutely wonderful parents, and a great sister, too. Well, I, I certainly have met them, and I uh, can attest to all that you say when you talk about the kind of support that your parents have provided yes. for you and your sister. And I yes. think that we all um, hope that we have that same kind of connection yes. in our own personal lives. Yes. So exactly. you went to uh, Prince George's <laughs> County Public Schools, am I correct? Some Prince George's, some in Washington, D.C. My mother worked in Washington, and so we were in a Catholic school um, close to her a job there. We were in some public schools here. Left here, went to Duke University for college and then came back to Maryland to go to law school at the University of Maryland Law School, and I've been here uh, since then. So why Duke? You know what? And it's not even sophisticated. It's not <laughs> a sophisticated story. In, in a, about sixth grade, I overheard a conversation my father was having with one of his colleagues, and the colleague said, I have this nephew. The nephew's attending Duke. He's a very smart boy, and he's going to be a lawyer. And when we left that conversation, I told my father, I'm going to Duke, and he said, if you work hard enough to get accepted there, your mother and I will do everything in our power to pay and make sure you can complete it. 
he did that, he lost his job, I have to tell you, my last year in college. And um, <clears throat> it was a very difficult time for the family, but he struggled so hard to make sure I could graduate. And that has framed my work, uh, even as a prosecutor, because I remember, and as a public servant, I'm constantly reminded um, that the gifts we've been given aren't for us. You know, that all of the support we've enjoyed is not for us, but there is this distinct expectation that you will do something to enhance the lives of other people. These sacrifices that were made, my parents' sacrifices, people I never knew, were sacrifices that were intended to allow me to contribute to my community, and I've tried to do that. And I remember all the time the sacrifices, especially that one, um, getting me through uh, college and law school. And I'm you know, just so proud every day that I have the chance to repay in some small way uh, all the things that were given to me. Well, you know, I always think about the fact because we, we certainly share some other connections. And, and one of our late great sorors, because we are both members of Delta Sigma yes, Theta indeed. Sorority Incorporated, said so eloquently the, the late Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm that service is the rent we, we pay. pay for yes, our time on earth. And yes, it certainly do. sounds as though that has been part of your background, part of your calling. So, yes. so when you were at Duke, what kind of student were you? Well, you know what? This is what, what um, is interesting about Duke. Duke was challenging for me. It really was. I, I attended Banneker Senior High School, which is one of the city's finest high schools. And again, I was really uh, blessed with great instructors. But what struck me is even so, when I got to Duke, it was a struggle for me. I competed against students um, who had even more resources in their, in their high schools. For example, Banneker, uh, we, we ended with trigonometry. And many of my classmates uh, had calculus many years mm -hmm. prior. So anyway, I, was a, a, I worked really, really, really hard. Um, I was a part of the honors board there. I took advantage of every opportunity. I was a part of the um, Duke. Um, they had a mentoring program. I'd catch the bus to mentor one of the young children in uh, Durham. Durham Companions was the name of the program. So I was active there. I, again, tried to take advantage of everything it offered. But I loved Duke. was a wonderful experience for me. Durham is a great community. Um, but, you know, it really did give me a lot. And then you, you left Duke and you enrolled in the University of Maryland, the law school. I did. So what was, what was that connection? Again, do we go back to the, the, the family incident in Seneca, South Carolina? Is mm -hmm. that what prompted you to think about law? You know, I always knew I would fight for other people. I just, there is something always uh, in my personality that allows me to fight for other people. And I knew that becoming a lawyer would allow me to do that. I didn't know exactly what area I would practice, um, but it soon came to me. As a law clerk, I had a chance to sit in the courtroom in Baltimore City. Judge Quarles, who's a very distinguished federal yes. judge, um, allowed me the opportunity, as well as Donna Hill Staden, to work. And I got to see uh, what happened in that courtroom. I watched those prosecutors fight. And I had a moment where I said to myself, and I have to tell you, when you ask me about Duke, for example, um, I learned later that I suffer from attention deficit disorder. And this caused, it was very difficult for me over the years. And I had a moment where I said, you know what? I will never spend a day in any career that I don't love, that doesn't make me jump out of bed in the morning, and that doesn't help other people. I found that um, in prosecution, that it allowed me to serve other people. And I have every moment that I've spent in this job, I have loved the work that I've done. Well, you, you mentioned certainly two great pillars when we think about the, the legal community, Judge Quarles and Judge Donna Hill State, and yes. I have the pleasure of serving with her on the Maryland State Board ah, of Education. So I'm awesome. um, very much aware of those two folks who served as, as role models and mentors for you. And what I'd like to say is that uh, we'll ask our audience to stay with us and stay tuned. My guest today is Angela Also Brooks, the state's attorney for Prince George's County. Life's this hard, it's no wonder 7,000 students drop out every school day. Visit BoostUp.org and help kids in your community stay in school. Body language.
voice can tell you all sorts of things. Like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. We're back with Prince George's County State's Attorney, Angela Also Brooks. Let's turn the conversation from education to your legal career. So you served as an education liaison, yes. a litigator, and a government administrator. What does it mean for you to be elected the county's first female state's attorney? Well, you know, it, it really has been a tremendous honor um, to have that as a distinction. But the thing that I'm also mindful of is that I have a responsibility to ensure that I'm not the last woman who serves the state's attorney. And so we've spent quite a bit of time in the office um, mentoring young women. Uh, we've, I've made it my business to go out into the schools and talk to young people and really hope to encourage others um, and to remind them that everything is possible. So can you talk to us a little bit about what's the mission and major goals of the state's attorney's office? The mission of the office is firm, fair, and consistent prosecutions. That's been especially important to me as we talk about justice and what that means. Justice is firm. It means that it is our responsibility to keep this community safe, to do everything we can to combat that uh, violent repeat offenders. So we've worked to decline violence, and we've, we've been very successful there. We've had a 40% decline in homicides over the last four years. We've seen about a 36% decline in overall violent crime. So we've worked hard to be firm, but fair is important as well. Yes. And uh, prosecutors have, I think, the most wonderful role in the courtroom in that their only mission is to ensure that justice is done. That means that we represent not just the victims who are in the courtroom, but to some extent the defendants who are seated at the table to make sure that their trials are fair, that they have a fair opportunity to be heard as well. And that really is our mission, firm, fair, and consistent. Justice is really what we are about. Wow, I, I would think that as um, we think about a, a 40% um, reduction in crime, uh, certainly an, an increase in conviction rates as you think about being, you said, uh, fair, firm, firm and uh, consistent yes. and how you apply the law and how you make sure that you're taking care of not just the victim but the defendant as well. So what do you consider at this stage to be your greatest accomplishment as the state's attorney? You know, I think it's the collaboration. I think that really is it. It's not just the results, it's how we got there. We've built relationships across this government. We have an outstanding county executive. We have a really great chief of police, the sheriff. We've built relationships across this community with our community members. We have a community in the courthouse program where members of the community come every month on the fourth Friday of the month to meet with us. So we've built these partnerships, and so together, the results that we're talking about aren't as a result of just me and my attorneys and other staff. This means that we have all together, kind of bound together to protect our community. And I think that really has been our greatest accomplishment, is that everyone can see that we're working together. Well, uh, so if we talk about accomplishments, then what do you think is the greatest challenge? What are those things that are yet to be done? Oh, wow, the challenges are great. And, and much of the challenge is that when we see crime, crime generally, I think, is a, a symptom of another problem. And so, for example, domestic violence and family mm -hmm. violence, which we saw last year, it just, it's horrible. We had 19 of our 54 homicides last year were domestic in, in nature. But what we noticed as well is that these don't start at the point of the violence. We very often yes. see that these children who are hurt people hurt other people. And so a lot of the challenge for us has been not only responding to crime, but what do we do to really prevent crime? What do we do to have fewer victims every year? And that really has been a lot of the, the, the challenge has been there. 
a challenge with resources. We have been uh, in a situation, although the county executive has been very helpful and the state has been helpful, uh, where we had far fewer attorneys and other staff than offices of, uh, that handle similar caseloads. And so it's been a resource issue, um, but we've also just, the challenge really is, it's not good enough just to respond to crime. The true challenge is preventing it from ever happening in the first place. And, wh and what do you see the role of the community in helping to do that? I think the community is doing its part by coming down to the courthouse and, and making themselves aware of the crimes that are occurring in their community. We saw last year, for example, that 22, we had a 22 percent increase in calls to 911 and calls to crime uh, solvers. And so the community is really stepping up to be engaged. The community has to come down for jury duty. You know, very often I hear people say, oh my goodness, I don't want to go. Um, but the yes. community has a role, and that role is that you have to participate. Nothing happens unless you participate not only in the political process and elect people who share your values, but it means that you also have to be really active. Come to the courthouse for jury duty. Find out what's happening in your community. There's a way for us to prevent these crimes by just being vigilant. And, you know, I, I think about that as well because we all get our summons for jury duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are so correct when you say some people tend to determine how they can figure out ways not to serve. Yeah. But there are so many more who are very much committed to serve and yes. committed to ensuring that we live here in Prince George's County in such a way and have such a quality of yes. life mm -hmm. where we want to continue to raise our families and uh, certainly, as we say, work, live, and play. And what clearly is a great county. It is a great so. county. I'm always amazed and just inspired. I go to community meetings on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night, sometimes it's cold, and guess what? The room is filled to capacity. So no one can ever say to me that this is not an engaged community. It is. It's a wonderful community, and we really couldn't do the things that we're doing without the support and engagement of our community. Well, the other thing we know that is, as you talk about sort of being vigilant at home, Yes. We also know that you have the opportunity to go to Annapolis and to mm -hmm. really lobby for, for legislation that impacts all of us. Are there yes. any particular uh, uh, legislative initiatives that you have uh, in store during this legislative session? So this legislative session, yes, there are two bills that we were recently in Annapolis to testify on behalf of. One would make it um, a crime of violence, home invasion, a crime of violence. Uh, would classify it that way, which is very important because there are enhanced penalties that come along with crimes of violence. In a home invasion, I can't think of anything that is more disruptive to a family's sense of security than a home invasion, a burglary that occurs while it, the home is occupied. And so we went down to testify to have this classified as a crime of violence so that we can seek higher penalties uh, for those crimes. In addition to that, we went down to seek uh, to have the sentences increase for second-degree murder. Uh, this is very important, too, from 30 years to 40 years. Maryland, as it turns out, is only one of 10 states uh, that does not allow you to sentence greater than 30 years for second-degree murder. This is particularly important in domestic violence cases, where a crime most jurors feel that these are crimes of passion and don't generally tend to find first-degree murder, which has to be premeditated. Um, and so second-degree murder, you think of a person who stabbed someone 90 times, for example. We had a case like this with Nathan Rogers who stabbed his pregnant girlfriend over 90 times, including 40 times in her face, um, convicted of second-degree murder. But guess what? A 30-year sentence means in 15 years he can be back in our community. That's not enough. And so that's, those are two of the measures that we are testifying uh, to support this year. Wow. Well, you know, the other thing we know is that you, you have a family, and what we're going yes. to do as we... Um, again, uh, return to our audience and ask them to continue to enjoy the show because we have with us the state's attorney, Angela Also Brooks. We'll come back and ask you a little bit about how you balance career and family. Thank you. Kids witness bullying. Oh, look! Your crush is looking at you. <laughs> Poor you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you because no one. Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov.
Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. Are you getting this, honey? Oh, prime time. We are rolling. <laughs> All right, Mama's gonna bring it home. Mama's okay. gonna bring it home. Okay. 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 Come on. <laughs> Watch this guy. Oh, oh it's backwards. Oh. Woo! Don't. Oh. Okay. It went into Bob and Carol's yard. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Here it goes. Oh, oh. oh my! Oh, Challenge your kids to be active and eat healthy. Yeah, Mama. All right. Let's see what you can do. Let's go. They might surprise you. Search We Can for more ideas on how you and your kids can get healthy together. We're back with State's Attorney Angela Also Brooks, and we're going to focus on what we call work-life balance and your community involvement. Okay. So we know that you're a mom, so how, how do you balance that? Well, you know, I, so I have a nine-year-old daughter, and she's so much fun. So the balance is I d had to decide pretty early on that with all of the commitments I had, she had to be first. Um, and so, we, you know, I, I keep a very busy calendar, but I want to make sure at all times that she understands that she's first. So that means that, you know, I, uh, for her school, for brownies, it's tough. You know, I think I'm no different than any <laughs> other family. You know, I'm on two wheels most of the time. But I do it with the support of family, with her father and his family and my family, and we all just kind of work together um, to support this wonderful little girl. You know, that reminds me when my son was younger and I used to even be able to determine when I could leave work and run to the Sports and Learning Center because he ran track. Yes. And uh, I always had that relationship with his coach so he could give me just about the right time when mm -hmm. the 800 meter run would start <laughs> okay, so, so that I could be, be in the stand. So, yeah. so we important. certainly understand that it is important for oh, our children important. to know yeah, that they're so first. Important. It is so important for her to understand that no matter what else is happening, and she gets that, but she understands that the work I'm doing is important as well. And I think she's supportive of that. She is such a wonderful child. She uh, comes to events with me when it's appropriate. She's excited about those events. <laughs> Um, and so, and I see her sometimes with her dolls and she's talking to them, she's addressing them. So some of this is rubbing off on her <laughs> as well. So it, it um, I'm no different than any other mother. I think we do the best we can for our children. Um, and we want to do, we want them to, 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 we want to set a good example for them as well. Absolutely. And then as you talk about that, I know that setting that good example also, I think extends to your community life. We've talked about your work as state's attorney and what you've done in terms of going out into the community and into schools. But we also know that there are some social causes that are important to you. And uh, one of them certainly is the Youth Summit yes. that you've been responsible for um, being just yeah. a great part of here in Prince George's County. Talk to us about that and why is that important to you? You know, children are important to me in general. I think about my own daughter, Alex, and I think about the life she's allowed to have and I think every child deserves um, to have a community and a family that supports them that understands and that fights for them and that isn't limited to just my child mm -hmm. all of these children I believe belong to this community and I'm also reminded as I watch defendants come to the courthouse just this morning I was present for the sentencing of a man who was 66 years old and when he had an opportunity to speak in front of this judge he immediately talked about things that happened in his childhood, watching his mother walk away from the family, the bitterness his father felt, and he eventually killed his wife who tried to leave him. So I'm aware that it is so important. Hurt people hurt people. We have got to support our children. And so I've made it my business with the, with the Sisterhood Summit, and there's a Brotherhood Summit, to try to instill strong self-confidence, healthy self-confidence, to talk to them about teen dating and violence, to do everything we can to invest in and protect children. It is so critical, and as I said, it's not just my child, it's every child deserves to have us as a community.
do what we can to ensure that they have the opportunity mm -hmm. to live a productive life. And you know, if we think about the, the sort of other side of that spectrum, and, and it is as we uh, see uh, an older community, uh, a more mature community. Yes. Talk about your commitment to seniors. Yes, to the elders. And so there are two categories. I think it is well understood that if you hurt either of them, it's going to, to make yes. you really fight hard. And that's <laughs> one children and the other is an elder. And we have many elders who have been targeted, um, especially over the last few years in financial crimes. Uh, we've had many seniors who have been harmed physically, but we do see a lot of financial crimes against seniors. And so we have an elder abuse unit that is through our special prosecution unit in the office. It's the only unit of its kind in the state. And we, we reach out to seniors. We have a day that we put aside every fall where we have all of our resources. We talk to them about protecting themselves from financial crimes. Um, and, and we are really uh, fighting hard um, to make sure as well that we hold accountable individuals who exploit, many times it's their relatives, um, who gain access to their financial resources, deplete them. Um, and these very trusting elders, uh, you know, really do love the relationships with that one family member Remember. who checks in to, for you and who comes and visits you. And it's very difficult to admit. There's a shame associated with admitting, you know what, someone I love so much, I think is taking advantage of me. And so it's, it's really difficult, um, but we do what we can to protect our elders. And, and you know, you've, you've mentioned uh, uh, just a, a few times about the kind of domestic violence that goes on and that hurt often um, stems from hurt. And you know that across the nation's uh, colleges and universities, community yes. colleges, four-year colleges, that we are all charged to be ever vigilant about the, the instances of uh, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, domestic yes. violence that occurs on our college campuses. And even here at Prince George's Community College, we received a grant from the Department of Justice as we talk about violence against, against women. So talk to me about what it is that you think that colleges and universities can continue to do as we work with that population and help them, I think, attain the kind of confidence and, mm -hmm. and skill sets that uh, you so aptly have spoken about during this program? I think removing shame is huge. Uh, we know, for example, that one in four women will be sexually assaulted, for example, before they're 18. And among college women, we know one in five will be sexually assaulted during their time in college. But there is so much shame associated with reporting it because we find that fewer than 5% of women Absolutely. who have ever been assaulted feel comfortable reporting it. Um, they are concerned, of course, that they will be blamed somehow. So really bringing attention to the issue, educating not only the, the women and men who will be involved in these situations as victims, um, but making sure that we educate perpetrators as well about what this looks like, what's appropriate conduct. Um, and, and I think it goes a long way. One of the other areas that we have to tackle, and I know that it is taboo to do so because uh, people say, well, kids will be kids. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a huge, yes. huge issue. When do we address it and say, not in a way that blames. The victim is never to blame, whether they are intoxicated or not, but really educating people about the dangers of alcohol and doing what we can to protect our young people in a way that does not allow them to be intoxicated to a point where they can be assaulted, or to also allow people to watch a person who has been, uh, in, who is intoxicated to a point where they cannot protect themselves. So making sure that we uh, empower people to, um, to be responsible um, with, with alcohol and also empower people to protect others. If you see some person who is uh, staggering and you can tell that that person mm -hmm. is uh, outside their um, ability to care for themselves, step in and do something to help that person. And I think those two things will go along. Right. Well, you know that um, we want to thank Ms. Also Brooks for thank sharing you. her story and the important work that she's doing to keep thank our you. county safe. The one thing we know is that you always talk about a safer, stronger, and more prosperous Prince George's County. Yes. And I don't think we could have a better state's Thank attorney. You. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much you. for being with us. Thank you for having me.